Good morning, everybody. Good to have you all here this morning. Of course, it's that time of the morning where we wake ourselves up with some praise. So come on, let's stand. Here we go. Come on, come on. You can sway side to side. Even you guys at home, welcome. (laughs) Waking up knowing there's a reason. All my dreams come alive. Life is for living with you. I've made my decision. Come on. Lift me up, fill my eyes with wonder. Forever young in your love, it's freedom I take with you. The moment is wasted. Here we go. See the sun now bursting through the clouds. God, for this moment in time where we can come together, Father. Lord God, under one roof, under one God. Lord God, fill us afresh this morning, Father. We know your Holy Spirit is here in this place right now. But Father, we thank you, Lord God. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that, Lord, there might be a storm happening outside. But Father, in here and at home, Lord God, we ask that the storms that that are within us, Lord God, we ask right now, fill us afresh, Lord God. We cast out all storms, Lord God, in your mighty name, Jesus. In your mighty name, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Fill us afresh. Fill us afresh. Fill us afresh, Lord God. Fill us afresh as we stand before you this morning, Lord. Can go back to the beginning. Can control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the middle is the place where you promised to be. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? 
Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? As I walk down through the valley, let your love rise above every fear. Like the sun shaping the shadow. In my weakness, your glory appears. Not enough unless you come.
The Lord is in this place with us right now. Holy Spirit is moving in this place right now. Drop your fear this morning. We ask you if you need prayer or if you need to stand in the gap for somebody. The Lord is here. And we have people who want to pray for you or pray for the people that you need to stand in the gap for. So we invite them up now. We invite you up to drop your fear and understand the Lord is here and he wants to help you. Let's continue to worship. You're not done with us. You're moving as we see. Oh, Lord, you're not done with us. You're moving as we see.
Thank you, Lord. Let's give our worship team a hand. They've been at conference and they're still here doing their thing this morning. Welcome, church. I'm going to ask you to take a seat. Good morning. Right, good morning to those online as well. I hope you're all having a fantastic Sunday so far. Started well because you're already here this morning, so you've already made your first good choice for today. Right, we're going to run through the housekeeping first, a few announcements, and then we'll get into family time and some celebrations. So if you're new here this morning, welcome. We're pleased to have you here. Um, If you are new, we have these fantastic cards called the One Card. If you have a look on the back, there's a box you can tick to say, yes, I want to know more about Elim, and we would love to do that journey with you. You Also, if you hand it in at reception, you'll get a free coffee as well, so it's a good thing all around. Also, if you do that, because we want to help you on your journey, you'll also receive this amazing book, but I do it does come with a warning, it will change your life, but for the good, so that's a good thing. Right, housekeeping as well, if you are new here, if you want to use the bathrooms, they are just through the back door, men on the left, women on the right, you will see the signs I'm sure. Also, if our alarms go off, we will go out in an orderly fashion, across the car park and to the grass on the other side, but I'm sure we will be fine this morning. A couple of other little announcements before we carry on, new service times for winter. As I was saying this morning, there's no such thing, I don't believe, as good weather and bad weather. It's just wet or dry. God made all of it, right? We need all of it. So in the wet weather, as it gets a little bit colder and a little bit darker, we're going to be having our new service time starting in July. So it'll be 9 o'clock is moving, yeah, 8.30 is moving to 9 o'clock, and 10 o'clock is moving to 10.30. So you just get a little bit longer to have a little bit more of a sleep in on those days. I think that's everything, one card, housekeeping, yep, right, so family time, I've actually remembered everything, I didn't remember everything in the first service, <laughs> can I ask Paul to come up and do crunchies with us, right, should we pray, yeah. all these amazing things, Lord, thank you, thank you for new ba- numerical babies, Lord, thank you for birthdays, thank you for um, 50-year-olds, 74-year-olds, and 14-year-olds, Lord, we just thank you, and two-year-olds, we just thank you for all the amazing things that you're doing in our church, for our families, we ask you to bless all the families today, and all their extended families as well, we thank you for families returning safely from overseas, you are an amazing God, and you are in this place, amen. Amen. Thank you, Poro, for helping me out, I forgot forgot about crunchies in the first one. Thankfully, she saved me. <laughs> okay, um, kids' programs. On that note, your programs are starting now. 180 and Power Zone, you may go. Thank you. And it looks like I've covered everything I need to this morning. So on that note, I'm going to ask Pastor Ants to come and share our amazing message this morning. Let's give him a hand. Hey, welcome. Am I on? Last week I, ca- I, was, I had one, I said, my pack's on, but I forgot to connect it. So this, this week I'm a bit more onto it. I was going to get a crunchy for, because I realised me and Tapati were watching the game last night, <laughs> and, um, and he what, and the Blues won the Super Rugby, and I realised that that was the first time he actually watched the Blues win a title, because he wasn't born the last time they won it, 2003. And I, I was like, this is a special moment. Anyway, <laughs> let's move on. Let's move on. Hey, welcome. We're, we're in part three of our series, Philippians, the book of Philippians. And what we've been doing, we've been going through chapter by chapter by chapter. And this is part three, so we are up to chapter four, three. We're up to chapter three, because next week is chapter four. So that's what, uh, what we're going to be looking at, and we're going to be in chapter by chapter. And I was thinking back, way back when I was uh, just a young fella, knee high to a grasshopper. Um, and uh, I, I grew up in a Pacific Island family. My mum's from the Cook Islands. So just like what islanders do, they drag their kids to church. And, uh, and I had this kind of belief. I kind of believed that in order to get to heaven, you had to have this checklist done, right? And part of the checklist is, one, you've got to do good things, check. You've got to go to church um, quite regularly, check. You've got to read your Bible, pray, Check, check, and you've got to be baptized. And if you haven't checked all the boxes, you're not going to heaven. And you know, it's really interesting is I, I wasn't actually taught this thing. I wasn't taught this, but I just kind of assumed it. 
Anybody else know what I'm talking about? He just kind of assumed this is how you get to heaven. This is what it is. And um, I remember um, when I was about 10 and my cousin were the same age, and uh, we, we rocked up the church, and then next to not, all the babies are getting christened. And if you don't know what christening is, christening is like a baby baptism. Okay? So where they get the baby, and then they, they, they dunk them in the water, and then they look for the baby, and they bring them back up again. Um, no, no, so they, we just sprinkle water on the head. Okay. Okay. Oh, it's another baby. Where did this one come from? Yeah. Um, and I, I remember, like, my cousin was getting christened. He was 10 years old before the other babies. I was shocked. I was shocked. And when he, after this christening, after church, this is what I said to him. I said, you're so lucky you never died. Honestly. Because you just got christened right now. If you had died, you would have gone to hell. You're so lucky. You know, you got that ticked off. Okay. You're so lucky. And I, and I kind of, I kind of, um, I thought, this is what you need to believe to go to heaven, which was really hard for me, considering I really hated going to church. Anybody else like me growing up? And I, I found it like so irrelevant to my life, and I found it so boring. This is me, and I'm like, I oh, know I'm so bad, right? And I, felt, and I thought, oh my gosh, it's so hard to, be, uh, to go to heaven, because all the things I need to get there, I find it really hard to do, right? And if you're looking for a subtitle for my message this morning, it is, good enough, question mark. Good enough, question mark. You know, if you're here this morning, have you ever felt like you weren't good enough? Good enough for anything. Good enough to get into that sports team. Good enough to, to uh, apply for that job. You had the qualifications for that job, but you just didn't think you are good enough to, to, to uh, roll, roll around with all those other people in, the, in that area. You just thought you weren't good enough. You didn't have what it took. Or maybe you're in this room, and the reason why you stopped going to church... It's because you thought you weren't good enough for God. You weren't good enough for church. You tried. You have tried. I've, I've tried before. I really did. I tried and tried and tried to be good. But I just kept failing and failing and failing. Then I got to a point and I was like, why even bother? This is what chapter 3 is all about. In the book of Philippians, as, as the Apostle Paul begins to write to this church in Philippi. And, and, and the church in Philippi is this church that the Apostle Paul had planted around 50 AD. And it was located in Greece. It was a Roman colony. They had gone and, they, they, and there was a colony in northern Greece called Philippi where they spoke Latin and, and, and they were citizens of Rome. It was this, 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 it was this colony called Philippi. And he begins to write to them in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. And if you've got your Bible, turn with me to verse 1. It says, Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. That's a good way to start. Rejoice in the Lord. No matter what happens, no matter what you're going through in life, rejoice in the Lord. No matter how bad things get, continue to rejoice in the Lord. And I'll never get tired of telling you these things. And I do it to safeguard your faith. You know what's really interesting with chapter 3? Chapter 3, after this verse... Apostle Paul goes into warning after warning after warning, which kind of makes it look like it doesn't quite fit. But the Apostle Paul is trying to give us a key to your faith, that no matter what you go through in life, the joy of the Lord is your strength. When everything else seems to be going against you, lean on God and let God give you joy. Joy in your storm. Joy in your loneliness. And he goes on to verse 2. Apostle Paul says, Watch out for those dogs. He's not talking about the, you know, that, that neighbor that has that dog that barks all night. Not, not talking about your household. You, you, Bruno is awesome. So your neighbors. No, just kidding. Or, 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 or that house. When you're, when you're, is anybody like me? Like, you know, you know the houses that have dogs. And you, when you're walking to school, you will cross on the other side, you know? Or you're walking down that alleyway and you know there's always a dog there and you're just like, as a little kid, you're just running as fast as you can and, the, and you feel like the dog's going to jump over the fence, right? And the, and the fence, is, fence is this big and the dog is this big, <laughs> right? He's not talking about those kind of dogs. He says, watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. Aren't you glad that that's not a requirement to join this church? 
after the service, we've got a special ceremony of circumcision. <laughs> Deacons, could you sharpen the scissors, please? We've got a special, we're going old school, we've got some rocks. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking, that wasn't in my original notes, but anyway. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators. It sounds really harsh. But what the Apostle Paul is doing, he's turning the words of his opponents back onto them. Remember in chapter 1, as we went, as we went through chapter 1, he had, the, he had these people who were talking about the Apostle Paul behind his back. The Apostle Paul was constantly criticized for the way that he, sh- he brought about the gospel. He was criticized by Jewish Christ- Christians who said, if in order to be, a, to be a follower of Jesus, you must become a Jew first. He was constantly criticized by them. And he turns their words onto them. Firstly, if you're a Jew, Jews will look at non-Jews, the Gentiles. So if you weren't Jew, you were a Gentile. Anybody who's not Jew? Which means you're a Gentile. Well, they would call a non-Jew, un- the uncircumcised, the name they had for them were dogs. Those, those dogs over there, the uncircumcised, they're not, they don't belong to God's people. If they don't belong to God's people, then they're dogs. So he turns their words on them. He said, you are those dogs. You are, the, you are the true outsiders. If you're trying to insist that this is what it looks like, you're the true outsider. And secondly, the, the, these, these evildoers, the people who do evil, he's reversing the description of those people who insist that you must be saved by doing good works. The good works people. He's reversing it onto them. He's reversing what, the description that these good works people put on themselves and say, oh, look, you, you know, in order to be saved, you've got to be these, do these good works. You've got to follow the Ten Commandments. You've, you've got to do the, follow the Torah. You've got to follow the, the, the laws in the Old Testament. And he turns it on to him. He says, no, you, if you're insisting on this thing, you're the evil, de- uh, e- the evil doers. You're the evil doers here. You're the people who do evil. Paul says, you're not saved by what you do. You're saved only by what Jesus did for you on the cross. And thirdly, the, the Jewish tradition of circumcision was a sign of, of being in covenant with God. But Paul stresses, he says, the sign of being God's people, the true circumcision is worshiping by the Spirit and boasting in the work of Jesus. He goes on in verse 3, For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Paul calls Jews and Gentiles alike who worship God and spirit and who take pride in King Jesus. That is true circumcision, as worshiping King Jesus, putting, taking our pride in what Jesus has done for us, whether you're Jew or Gentile. That is true circumcision. And he goes on in verse 4. Though I could have confidence in my own effort. Anybody got confidence in your own effort to get to heaven? Though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. You think you got, you think you got confidence in your own efforts? Well, I outdo you. This is what he's, he's laying it down. He's going in verse 5. I was circumcised when I was eight days old, exactly what the law said. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel. I'm a member of the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin uh, was the only tribe that stayed with Judah when all the other ten tribes left and formed the northern kingdom. They were the only ones loyal to to the temple. I'm I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. You you want to talk about being, being 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 a Jew? No one's more Jewish than I am. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. And he goes on. A real Hebrew, if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees. I'm not just any Jew. You know, I I was a Pharisee. A Pharisee who demand the strictest obedience in Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for my righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. He's saying, I bet you you couldn't obey the law as much as I could obey. I, I did not... Uh, you know, if you're looking for someone who, who, who has never broken any law, this is me. I 
I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done for me. See, Paul's had enough. He said, you, can, you want to come here flapping in my face at how Jewish you are? I'm more Jewish than you are. Don't come to me as if that is something of importance. That means nothing. Nothing at all. In fact, it blinded me to the fact of, who, of God's plan for salvation in Christ, which is why I started persecuting the church. And he goes on in verse 8, Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Come on, you know what? You know, have, have, are we keeping, do we have records of, oh, look at all the great stuff I've done for God, look at all these things. Paul says, all that means nothing. That's not, it's got nothing to do with your salvation. It's good, but it's got nothing to do with your salvation. It's worthless. In fact, he goes on. What is he? he goes on. He says, For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage. Garbage. Rubbish. So that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I, I became righteous through faith. In Christ. How do you become righteous? By obeying the law or faith in Christ? What does Paul say? By faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with Himself depends on what? On keeping the Ten Commandments? Of, of what nationality you are? Whether you're circumcised or not? It depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that, so that one way or another, I will experience a resurrection from the dead. Paul is making it very clear. He is making it very clear. There's nothing you can do to make Jesus love you anymore. And the reason being is because he already loves you. There's nothing that you can do less to make Jesus love you less. Because he loves you just as you are and more. Because God is love. You don't have to prove your love to him. He already loves you. And, and when you make a mistake and when you fail, when you trip up, anybody been there before? He doesn't stop loving you. He doesn't love you less. He loves you anyway. And it's this love that transforms us. Let me tell you something. There's nothing you can do to lose your salvation. There's nothing you can do to lose your salvation. If you receive Christ, there's nothing you can do to lose that. You, do you know why? Because you never earned it. You did nothing to, you didn't earn, none of it is merited to you. It wasn't yours to lose. You received it. How did you receive it? By faith. Oh, if I, if ticked off this whole thing. And you know what? And it's not, it, and there's no merit in, as if, oh, you know, if I've got to do all these things to keep it. There's nothing you can do to lose. It wasn't yours to, to, to lose in the first place. But you can still turn your back on the salvation. You can still turn your back on Him. Because it's not based upon what you do, it's based on faith. It's about believing loyalty. What I mean by that is that you can't use Jesus as some kind of incantation. Well, you know, years ago I gave my heart to Jesus. I said those words. I said those magic words, Lord. I said the, I said, I, I, I said the salvation prayer. Then years later you start worshipping the devil or something else. There are no devil worshippers in heaven. It's about believing loyalty. See, we, we can't lose our salvation by what we do but we can choose not to believe anymore and we, and, and we turn our backs on it. Verse 12. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past, forgetting all the good things I've done, I've, none, of that, that, none, none of it's got anything to do with my salvation. Think about all those bad things I've done. 
oh, you know, oh, oh, what a wretched soul I am. That's got nothing to do with your salvation. And I'm looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. I'm pressing on to receive this heavenly prize. Verse 15, let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe that God will make it plain to you. If you don't agree, Paul's saying, if you don't agree with me, don't worry, you'll get there. God will help you out. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. See, the Apostle Paul wants to head off any idea that once you become a Christian, you've already arrived. You've, I've already arrived. Oh, now that I'm a Christian, I, I can live however I want to live. I can do whatever I want to do. He wants to hit, no, no, it's not about arrive. You have never, in fact, Paul, Apostle Paul wants to let you know, I haven't even arrived. And he says, and none of you have arrived either. None of you have arrived either. It's about believing loyalty. See, Apostle Paul was asked this question in Romans chapter 6, and we know he was asked this question because he replies in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. And, and basically it was this, it was, the question was this, well, if I, if I just believe in Jesus, does that mean I can, I can just keep on sinning? If I believe in Jesus, can I keep on sinning? And he was asked that question because that's kind of like what we ask, right? Oh, so therefore it's not based on what I do, and it's based on just believing in Him. Oh, so then I can just believe on Him and just keep on sinning? And the Apostle Paul says, no, 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 no. It's about believing loyalty. That's why he says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, we looked at this last week. He says, work hard to show the results of your salvation. See, good works don't earn or keep your salvation. Good works don't earn or keep it, but it shows it. It shows it. Let me just give you an example. If I said to my wife, this beautiful woman over here, talking to people online. If you're online, my wife is talking to you right now. I've handed back the computer to her. If I said to my wife, I, I love you. I say, I love you. I love you, Portal. I love you. But here's the thing. If I say I love her, but then I don't, I stop showing my love to her. I, I stop saying to her I love her. In fact, I don't even do anything nice with her anymore. In fact, I don't come home anymore. I don't come home at night, and I spend all my time with all the other ladies and all the leaders. <laughs> uh, this, isn't, this isn't a true story. I'm just using an example out there. <laughs> oh, man, if I say ants, oh, my goodness. But I said, hey, it's all good. I still love her. Just as long as I love her, it's all good, right? I can see all the ladies. I don't have to show her. I don't have to tell her. In fact, I don't have to see her. I, but I, just as long as I love her, that's what counts. And you'll be like, you fool. You fool. Your actions show that you don't love her. It's not about the words or something you said way back then. It's about believing loyalty. It's about being loyal to your wife. See, my, my, my actions... My actions, like if I was just showing good stuff to her, it, that doesn't mean that I, it doesn't prove that I love her, but, it's, but it shows that I love her. It's about believing loyalty. You, can't, you don't lose your salvation by what you do, but you can turn your back on it when you stop believing and you start worshiping something else, someone else, or something else. The Apostle Paul says, Don't lose your faith. Verse 17 Dear brothers and sister, sisters, Pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I, told, I, for I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows that they are, are really enemies of the, of the cross of Christ. And here he is, he's crying with these people out there living far away from God, and he's got tears in his eyes. They are headed for destruction. It's not about some magic words we say. I've said those words. Oh. Let, me, let, me, can I just, let me just be clear. It's okay to struggle in your faith. Doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. It's okay. It's, we've all, we all struggle. We're, we're all working, working away. It doesn't, it's okay to have doubts. Oh God, you know, I'm in the storm. God, where were you? It's okay to have that. 
That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking where I'm no longer believing. There is no God. I don't believe in a God. That's what I'm talking about here. I don't believe. That's, that's, That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. How can you tell the fruit of a tree? Or how can you tell what kind of fruit tree a tree is? By its fruit. If I showed you an orange tree, right? But I, in fact, if I showed you a lemon tree, I said, this is an orange tree. You go, that's not an orange tree. Yes, it is. It's, I'm telling you, it's an orange tree. Well, the fruit shows it's a lemon tree. Let me ask you, what kind of fruit are you producing right now? Oranges or lemons? Possible saying, imitate, imitate me because he imitates Christ. I remember like just being a young fella in the Lord. I'm still a young fella in the Lord. But I remember looking at some of my leaders and I was going, man, I, man, I wish I could know the Bible like these guys can. And I just began to imitate them and how in their practice with the Word of God. Who, is there someone in your life that you can imitate, that you can be like? Verse 20. But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for Him to return as our Savior. Now, we naturally think that, oh, heaven, that's where we belong. That's where we're going. But that's not what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's not saying that at all. Because where's Jesus coming? He's coming and we're waiting for him to return. So if we're there and he's here, we're, we're in the wrong place. It's not about that at all. Remember, Philippi was a colony of Rome, right? What's the purpose of a colony? A colony is to bring is to, is, is to bring their way of living and their rule and their authority of Rome into whatever area that they're in. That's what it was. When you're in Philippi, you, you won't say, oh, I'm a Roman citizen and I'm longing to go there. No, it's, it's the other way around. It's about bringing Rome here. The church, are, we are citizens of heaven. In fact, we are a colony of heaven. We are meant to bring the rule and life of heaven to earth. Are you bringing that to your workplace? Are you bringing that to your place of education? Are you Christ's ambassador right where you are? Because we are a colony of it. We are to bring heaven to earth. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. Right where you are. Then he goes on in verse 21. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them in the gl- into glorious bodies like his own which is why I'm, what I'm hoping for. Hopefully I can transfer my family pack into a six-pack. <laughs> Using the same power which he will bring everything under his control. See, living in hev- heaven isn't the end goal. That's not the end goal. Rather, it's living in God's new world in our new bodies. That's the end goal. The heavenly prize seems to be Resurrection life itself, that's the heavenly prize, is resurrection life. That one day that we'll be resur- if we die here on earth, that one day we'll be resurrected again. That's the heavenly prize. Which means it's living in, in the present and light of the future. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean for me? It means you don't have to run away when you make a mistake. That's what we naturally do. We, we run away like that time we kicked the ball through the lounge window. Sorry, Mom. You, you know, it's so funny. We're outside playing with all the, all the kids. Aren't if you want to clear the backyard, just kick the ball through the window. Kick the ball, bang, scatter. Everyone's gone. And everyone's asking, who was it? Who was it? And they're, oh, so-and-so. And they always point back, you know, like, you know, what do you say to all your friends? You know, um, snitches get stitches. Snitches get stitches. Anyway, we just scatter, we run. Here's the thing. When you mess up in God, when you make a mistake in God, it means you don't have to run away. Is that we can run to Him. We can run to our Savior. 
It means that you don't have to give up when you fail. Anyone failed in their walk with God? You're looking at one of the biggest failures around. I was just going to say, you're looking at one of the biggest losers around, but the failure sounds... See, our greatest glory is not ever failing, but it's in rising every time we fall. Don't let your past sabotage your future. Don't let your past sabotage your future. See, what areas in your life are you failing? Right? What areas are you failing? Because when you can identify those areas, and, I, and I, even as I say that, you, even as I just, I just get a sense of my spirit, the people in this room, straight away, you know exactly what it is. I don't have to tell you where you're failing. You know. And stop fooling yourself. Deep down, you know where you're failing. But it means you don't have to run away. It means you don't have to give up. thinking, where the heck am I? <laughs> My wife just said, oh, I'm just still wondering myself. What areas in your life are you failing? Because that's the area where you need to grow. Come on, recognize those areas. That's where you need to grow. What areas in your marriage are you failing? What areas in your walk with God are you failing? Because that is, are the areas where you need to grow. That's the area we need to press into. I love what John Maxwell said. He says, fail early, fail often, but always, 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 always fail forward. The more you do, the more you fail. Have you ever noticed that? Because here's the thing. We, we, we want to protect ourselves from failing so we don't do anything. We want to try anything. Oh, I don't want to try anything because I'm afraid of failing. We can't live life like that. You will fail. You will make mistakes. In your Christian walk, you will still fail. In your marriage, you will fail. In whatever relationship you you will fail. But failure is only final if we don't give, get back up again. The more you do, the more you fail. The more you fail, the more you learn. And the more you learn, the better you get. You know, like I said at the start of my message, I said that I used to think this, we had to do all these things to get to heaven. And the, the problem I had was I had an issue with the church. I didn't like it. Because I tried to do all these things. I, man, I was, one of my biggest traumas came from the church. As a kid, you know, they thought it was this great idea that we should do a Sunday school play. It was an Easter story. And we all know there's always one Easter story that we play, right? And I got cast as Judas. You got to understand, I went to a Pacific Island church. I was the only white kid. So who, guess who became Judas? The white kid. I had one role. Seriously. I didn't even have a speaking part. Well, I don't think I had a speaking part. I can't remember. I was too traumatized. I, my, my job was this. I, I, I come out, and then Jesus is over there. I've got to walk, walk over and give Jesus a kiss on the cheek. That was my job. That's all I had to do. Jesus was played by my Sunday school teacher, which was a woman. I just want to give you that piece of information about me kissing somebody. And so I'm, I'm almost a man. I'm 12 years old. I step out, and all I see is people, and I'm like a stun mullet, possum in the headlights. And I just freeze. I clam up. I'm there for so long. Jesus walks across the room and gives me a kiss on the cheek. <laughs> After the service, because all I was thinking was this, my mom's sitting in the audience, right? If you know island mums and how island mums are, I was just imagining in my head, she's sitting at the back and all the other island mums know that I'm her son because I'm the only white kid. And they're like, hey, isn't that your boy? No, oh, that's not my boy. I don't know who that is. I'm, are you sure? I'm sure that's your boy. No. After the service, my mom comes up to me. You know what she says to me? She said, honey, it's okay. It's about you tried your best. I love you. And she, and she gave me a big... Okay, that didn't happen. You know what she said? She said, when we get home, you're going to get a hiding. <laughs> that's what she said to me. Although we're in a church. 
when you get home, you're going to get a hiding. I'm so glad when I got home, she, obviously Jesus was on her and I didn't get a hiding. I survived. But you know, because of that, I was afraid to talk. Public speaking was my greatest fear. M- m- man, if, if I was speaking at school for my, I would wag. One time I had no choice and I walked in class and I, I was now, I was like my second last year in high school and I still froze. I come up in front of me and I just couldn't. My legs shaking. It was, honestly, public speaking, I, it kills me. I just can't do it. It's impossible. I'm a failure. There's no way that God will ever use me to speak to people, which is crazy considering what I do now. In fact, at our church, we had Sunday school exams. I was like, it's not fair. I've got to school Monday to Friday. Now I've got to go to school on a Sunday? Man. And every year, my, my answers were exactly the same. I would get turn up to Sunday school exam. I'll write the same thing every year. Just my name. That's it. Close the book. And then us church for you, they'll put the results of everyone's. This is an island church. It, it, top, top students write all their names. They put everyone's names down the bottom, the bottom student. Guess who's at the bottom? I had the record for five years straight being at the bottom. At least I was consistent. This is all kind of ironic considering what I do today. Here I am teaching the Bible. Here's the thing. Don't let your past sabotage your future. You may be here and you've, you've, got some, you've, got, you've got young children, you've got grandchildren, whatever. And maybe they, they, they said, no, nah, church is boring. I, ha- I don't like coming to church. And you're like, oh, I don't know, I'm trying my hardest trying to get them into God. Don't give up on them. Keep praying for them. Because there could be one of those kids could be someone like myself. That's exactly how I saw church. I wish my kids were like all those other kids. My kids just average. You know what average means? It means normal. We make average sound like it's not good enough. Average means like everyone else. And there's nothing wrong with like being like everyone else. Uh, you look, you're looking at someone who's average. I passed school but through the skin of my teeth. Now, I didn't have much skin on my teeth. Anyway, anyway, where did that come from? Carry on. Don't let your past sabotage your future. Because here's the thing. We, we, we think faith is like, make it, there's like some stairway to heaven, right? Like there's a stairway. Heaven's up there. Heaven's up here. This is heaven. But we're way down there. And, and it's like, okay, you know, okay, be a good person. And you take a step. I'm a big good person. Go to church. And, and we do all these things. We're trying to step, trying to make way up to heaven. There's a problem. Every one step we take, we take two steps back. We, we do more moonwalking than we do going forward. And we're trying our best to get up there. And we just fail and fail and fail. This is my life. Failing and failing and failing. Do you get the point? Why even bother? That's what... This, that's what salvation by works looks like. In fact, all the world's religion, this is what it looks like. But you know what I'm telling you about Christianity? It's the only one that doesn't look like that. In fact, there, are stairway, there is a stairway to heaven. And if you try to walk on the stairway, God will quickly tell you to, to get off the stairway. It was never meant for you. Because you can't do it. Because God saw you in your mess. He saw you in your hopelessness. He saw you in your misery. He saw you in your sin. And he loved you so much that he stepped out of heaven. And he stepped out and he came down right where you were in your suffering. And he bound himself with flesh. And in the fullness of Jesus Christ, he died on the cross for your greatest sin, for all your sin, for your, for your regrets, for your mess. He died so you can be free. That's what salvation looks like. It's what Jesus has done for you, not for what, what we do. We can't do it. I can't do it on my own. And when I received Jesus in my life, man, I found myself picking up the Bible. And I'm like, begin, I begin reading this book. Not because I had to, because now there was this relationship. I want to know this Jesus. Like, who, this person who changed my life, who loved me for who I am. There's nothing I needed to do. I want, who is this Jesus? I need, to, I need to know him more. And I found myself coming to church, not because I had to. Because I wanted to. I found my, like I hated singing, seriously. I, I would turn up when, back when the girls would invite me. The only time I would go to church when girls invited me to church. And I'll stand there and I'll be standing there like this. And they go, I noticed you don't sing. I don't sing. But now I'm here. I'm worshiping God. I'm singing all the flat notes. I don't care. Because I know God's got a good filter. <laughs> I am just feel sorry for those sitting standing next to me. They've got no filter. That's why sometimes I wonder why I'm standing by myself up the front. But he loves you, right? I found myself, you know what even, what even more amazing? The areas in my life that I was struggling in, I began to find victory in them. What changed in my life? It was relationship. 
It was a relationship with Jesus. See, good works doesn't lead to salvation. But it's the love that Jesus has for salvation leads to good works. I found myself doing these things, not because I had to, not because I was thinking about because my life was radically changed. And I, and I just couldn't, I, mean, I, I didn't want to do the things and no longer attracted me anymore. Don't let your past sabotage your future. It's about relationship, and relationship is meant to grow. It's about partnership. We don't have to do it on our own. He who began a good work in you will see it to the end. Don't let your past sabotage your future. Come on, let us pray. Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that you stepped out of heaven for us. That it's not, a, it's not about do, 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 but it's about done. That on the cross, you died for my sins. My greatest regret, you set us free. Lord, I'm praying for some, you know, if you're in this room, maybe you've been struggling. I get a sense, some of you have been struggling, you, you, and, you, and you keep questioning whether or not, because am I still saved? Am I still in God's kingdom? God wants to say, I love you. It's okay to struggle. It's okay to even doubt. I love you. Will you stand back up? Will you keep walking with me? It's a partnership. If you're here in this room, and maybe you've never had a relationship with God, or maybe you did, or somehow you kind of left them and you started worshiping something else, but right here, you want to get your life, you want to come back. It's about believing loyalty. Right now, you want to just come back to them. If that's you, you need to make a decision in your heart because it's about faith. It's not about words we say. It's about, oh, let's say this magic word. It's not anything like that. It's believing loyalty. Lord, I'm coming to you just as I am. My life is not perfect. In fact, it's very messy. You know, God will say, bring me your mess. For God so loved all the messy people of the world that He gave His only Son so that whoever believes in Him, not because you have done all these things, whoever believes in Him will have eternal life. So Lord, we come with our hearts wide open. Thank you for what you've done for me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come and give the Lord a hand wherever you are. Yeah. You know, if you're in this room and, and you said, maybe you're making a decision for the first time, or maybe you just, you know, you, it's been a while. You, you're like me. You've, you failed and you gave up, and you're back here again. If you're making a decision, we want to help you on your journey. And, and grab, what we want to do is grab the one card, tick the second box from the top. I'm recommitting or committing my life to Christ. Hand into the info desk. We're going to give you a gift. It's the gospel. It's the New Testament of the Bible. Read about Jesus, the lover of your soul, the author and perfection of your story, and we'll gift you this book on us. Well, next week is the final part, chapter four. Well, anyway, thank you, um, Michelle. So give the Lord a hand. Come on, praise God. Thank you, Ants. Okay, last messages. Real love serves. That is who we are as a church. God is real, as Ants was saying. He is real to all people. And there's nothing that we can do to make him love us more. So that's what we truly believe in. Love, love community. We want to do life with you. We want to help you on your journey. And the best way you can do that is to join a connect group. Find a group of people that you can talk to, share with, get help from, and have fun with. It will be the best thing that you do. Also, serves. We run an amazing program called Growth Track. It was running through our 10 o'clock services. Um, it's a three-week course. You can have been a Christian for five minutes or 50 years. It doesn't matter. This, tra this Growth Track is for everybody. Find your purpose. You, all of us have a purpose in God. And when you find that purpose and you want to do a little bit more, you might be able to join one of our amazing dream teams. We couldn't do what we do here without all the helpers that we have. And finally, giving. 
Matt and I were talking about this the other day as it was tax time, and we thought it's kind of like having a savings account with God because the government gives you back a third of it, and it always seems to come when we need it the most. So we were like, that's pretty cool, actually. Not only by your giving through one of our drop boxes or automatic payment or FPOS at the counter, not only are you helping the community and the schools and missionaries, you've got a savings account with God because you get some of it back, or you can retie that up to you. But we thank you for that as well. And as you go ahead into this week, just think about what fruits of the Spirit are you going to show in your workplace or just anywhere you are this week. God bless family and have a fantastic week ahead. Thanks.